Welcome everyone. This is Linda Cabayas. I'm part of the Enterprise Success Team at Lab Archives, and I'll be leading this training session for Carnegie Mellon University. And this is an introduction to Lab Archives, the professional edition. The professional edition is also known as the researcher edition. So let's start with what Lab Archives is. Lab Archives gives you a secure place to search, share, store, and even publish laboratory or research data online. We are more than just an electronic laboratory notebook. We're a digital research notebook and a research management platform. We're cloud-based. That means that Lab Archives can be used on any device with an internet connection, and it's also mobile friendly. Lab Archives supports the pillars of a well-informed research data management plan. And those are heavily being required by many funding agencies as well as universities. With regards to your current data management plan, if I were to ask you five years from now to see your data, would I be able to understand the data and how you got your results? Also consider the importance of reproducibility in science. Would I be able to reproduce your findings? Lab Archives has integrations with major lab and office applications. We give you many options for how you can get your data into a notebook, such as through your computer, mobile device, email, and direct, uh, excuse me, via direct entry right into Lab Archives. We also have partnered with a number of integration partners, including Office, GraphPad, Prism, SnapGene, and many others. Once all that data is uploaded, it's securely stored in the cloud. And a key piece of Lab Archives is the ability to export your data, including your entire notebook, down to a single entry. So in this slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about how the Lab Archives account works in access to notebooks. So we'll discuss more how Lab Archives is going to interact with your various lab and research team members and the different roles that are available through a notebook. So first, the notebook is at the center of your workflow here. And the owner is at the top. And the owner is typically the PI, but it could also be a lab manager, team lead, or a project lead. Typically, the PI will own all of the notebooks in a lab group. For every notebook in Lab Archives, there's exactly one and only one owner. The owner creates the notebook, and then they can distribute access to their notebook using the different roles. And those roles include administrator, user, and guest. Often, the owner may be a hands-off owner, meaning they're not in the notebook every day. Maybe they only occasionally go in. The administrator is next, and the administrator is invited by the owner. They have read-write access to all parts of the notebook by default, they additionally have the added benefit of being able to share and add guests and users to the same notebook. You can have multiple administrators, uh, but typically you will only have one or very few. And having administrators is a good idea for PIs that won't actively be engaging with the notebook. So what that means is the administrator is invited by the PI, and let's say that PI is kind of a hands-off owner. They're not in the notebook frequently. The benefit of adding the administrator is that now the administrator can help the PI manage the roles, meaning they can manage who has access to the notebook. And they can do that by inviting other members to the notebook. One of the other key members you'll find in a notebook is a user role. Typically, it's a postdoc, a researcher, or a graduate student, and it's someone that's performing research day to day. They have read-write access to all or parts of the notebook, and they're invited by either the notebook owner or the administrator. And then next you have the guest, so they're shown in gray. It's the lowest access role in lab archives. It tends to be an intern or an external collaborator. Typically, they're granted access to a folder, a page, or an entry, meaning it doesn't have to be the entire notebook, but it could be. And then by default, they have edit only rights for 60 days and then they move to read access only. So this is a good user option for temporary or external collaborators or interns. You can always transfer ownership of notebooks to other members. 
but likely this would be to another PI or a lab supervisor. So if someone is leaving the lab, moving on to a new position, you can transfer ownership so that the rest of the members of the lab can continue working without disruption. How the lab archives account works. So you have control and options that work with different researcher workflows and different data management needs. So this outlines a few of those ideas for you here. So some of the options for using your notebook include project-based notebooks. So we have our first option on the left there. Project-based notebooks um, include places where you can add users and their work. And the, excuse me, the work can be in individual folders within the notebook. You might have single lab notebooks, which are useful for small labs. So you can break down the project further um, by folders, subfolders, and by lab personnel. You have individual notebooks for lab members. And then for labs, we also even suggest a shared notebook that all members have access to, and that may contain protocols, inventory, template notebooks, or even meeting notes. So how you get started? So Carnegie Mellon has access to lab archives via the single sign-on that's been established through the university. So if you first go to mynotebook.labarchives.com, you'll come up with a pop-up screen similar to this here, where if needed, you'll need to go ahead and select Carnegie Mellon University from the pull-down menu. From there, you'll be able to add your email address and get access to your new account and new notebook to start using lab archives. At the bottom, we feature two resources. First is our technical support email, which is support at labarchives.com. You are welcome to reach out to our wonderful support team. We have close to 24 hour coverage. We're very close, I think it's about 22 hours of coverage and we have a great quick response rate to your questions. So any kind of questions that you may have, big or small, you can reach out to our technical support team for personalized assistance. And then below that, we have labarchives.kayako.com. That takes us to our knowledge base. We have several hundred support articles that are available. And I can also show you how you can access these resources via the interface when we start that tour in just a moment. Additionally, what I have highlighted here on your last slide are some local university resources that have been put together by your librarians. So we have a CNU Lab Archives information page that has been put together. I'm going to um, show you these pages here in just a moment. Additionally, we have an introduction to research data management workshop that's available um, with new Lab Archives information to be added there very soon. We also have upcoming libraries workshops with new lab, uh, lab archive sessions will be on the calendar as well. And then as a, a point of reference or some that you can reach out to locally, you have your research data services team made up of librarians that are available to assist you with lab archives. So if you have specific questions, perhaps in terms of, you know, how does lab archives work with some of our other data management resources that are available? That's a wonderful local resource. So from here, what we're going to do, we're going to transition over to our live demonstration of lab archives. And, and actually, before I do that, so you are looking at the Lab Archives notebook, but I mentioned I would preview some of your local resources for you. So let's start with that. I have those resources open in a separate tab, starting with your Lab Archives page that is hosted through your library's website. So you can see library.cmu.edu forward slash lab archives. So from there, you'll see a series of tabs, including your About Lab Archives page here with an introduction to the product, tips on getting started, and also featured are our public webinars that the Lab Archives staff hosts on a weekly basis. So we are right now covering the professional edition, so it's the edition for researchers. Every Thursday at 1 p.m., we host a live webinar. You're welcome to always register for that if you'd like. Also featured on this page is the Get Help. So that's the email address to your local librarians on the data services team. So if you have any questions about using Lab Archives and you need some kind of personalized attention and assistance, they're welcome to assist you and you can reach them right there. Additionally, you'll find some other useful tips under the Researchers tab. So that's gonna cover the professional edition. And then you may also find some help here via the restrictions page in terms of when is it appropriate to use lab archives. 
And again, those kind of um, specific questions can also be directed to your data services team here. Also featured are upcoming workshops. So soon to be scheduled be some additional lab archives training from your team there. And then also recommended is a research data management workshop that's also available through the library at osf.io forward slash hwngd. So next, let's go ahead and pop into Lab Archives and we'll start our official tour of the product. So we're in a live working Lab Archives notebook right now, and we're gonna go ahead and use this particular notebook for our demonstration today. To the left of the notebook here, this is the structure of the notebook. So it's very much set up in a hierarchy. Within your notebook, you have folders, you can even have subfolders, and then you also have pages. So looking at a page of the notebook right now, within the page, you have entries, and these are separate entries within my notebook. We're gonna spend a lot of our time today talking about the different entry types and how you get the content into Lab Archives. Once you create your notebook, you're free to add your folders, subfolders, and pages as you please. Through the plus sign symbol is exactly how you can do that. So if you right click, excuse me, if you click on that, that symbol there, and you can add a new folder or add a new page. So for example, let's start with a new page. We're gonna create a new page and we're gonna call it our demo page and that's where we'll add our entries for our training session today. When you first create a page, of course, it's empty. You're going to add data to that page via entry. So we're gonna cover that in more detail here, but very quickly, you can click the link to add new entries and different entry types that are available. But hold on to that and we're gonna cover that in just a moment. You can then take a page or a folder, subfolder. It's very easy to literally just drag and drop it to reorganize your notebook. So if I want this demo page to appear at the top, for example, very easily drag and drop that. You'll also find a deleted items bucket at the bottom of your notebook. Okay. It's important here to cover the deleted items notebook because unlike other services, none of your items in Lab Archives are ever permanently deleted. Okay. Other services may, for example, have a 30-day trash can where after 30 days the information is purged. But in Lab Archives, that information stays in there permanently. And that's important for a number of factors. Um, first of all, if you ever accidentally delete something, you'll always be able to retrieve it no matter how long ago. It's also important because oftentimes notebooks are shared among lab members and teams. And then sometimes the more people that have access to a product, the more uh-ohs or mistakes that can happen. So again, you can always retrieve your information there. So for purpose of research integrity, that's also important because a document, a note, or excuse me, that, that information will always be tracked even if it was deleted. If anything is ever deleted, we can always retrieve it. We can open up our demo items, or our deleted items, and also right click and undelete any item that we may need to. So again, just to very quickly show you, it's very easily open to folders to and access specific pages that you need. Moving to the top here, you'll notice that I have a, a little statement here that says notebooks 18. So this takes me to my notebook manager. You see I have a number of notebooks that are available for use. Remember we've covered this early in the PowerPoint where you yourself may have access to multiple notebooks. The notebooks that you see in the left there that are in black bold, those indicates, those indicate, excuse me, notebooks that I own. Okay, black bold, I am the owner of those notebooks. But you'll notice that I have access to other notebooks as well. And those are notebooks that I am a member of. So either a user or administrator or a guest. This just makes it very easy for me to select the specific notebook I need access to. You'll find um, next here is a little plus symbol. So I wanna quickly show you how easy it is to create a notebook. Clicking on that plus symbol gives us our create a new notebook screen where we can easily type in a new name of our notebook. Optionally, we can choose a notebook layout. So you have an, a number of layouts that are available, none, lab, classroom, or you can copy layout from another notebook. What you're copying here is just the structure. So some empty folders that are put together for you with these tags or these names on the folder. Let's say you like, you wanna use our lab folder, or excuse me, our lab notebook layout, but you wanna rename some or delete some. That's absolutely fine. So you can always remove, rename any of these folders because maybe you like 
half of the ideas there, maybe not everything that's suggested. Makes it very simple. After you create your folder layout, you would just click that create notebook option and that will launch you and create a live notebook for you. So we suggest you create a test notebook if you like, you know, maybe just one that you play around in to get used to lab archives and that's something you can do right away. After you create your notebook that you'll live la you'll launch live into your new notebook and again it's also accessible via that notebooks link. So for the rest of our demonstration today, we're going to work off of our demo page. But before we work off of that demo page, I want to continue some of the navigation here of the interface. So to the right, we have our inbox feature. So you do have the ability to email documents to yourself. Anything you email to yourself can be found via the inbox. We keep moving to the right hand side of the screen in the center is our search feature. We also have an advanced search page that's available. So this is very powerful because now you can search within the entire contents of your notebook. That also includes attachments. So if you have any text-based attachments like Word documents, Excel, PowerPoint, we'll search the content of that for those key terms you've entered. So that's really powerful because if we're thinking about, you know, the benefits of moving from a paper notebook to electronic, this is the big one. It's the ability to search that notebook. So rather than going to your bookshelf and searching through all 20 notebooks you're currently using, for example, or may have used in the past, you know it's going to take a long time to flip through page by page to find that information. Now you can do it very quickly via the search screen. Also, what makes it even more powerful, not only can you search within your current notebook, but you can limit yourself to all the notebooks as well, or expand that search, I should say. You can search by metadata, such as tags, keywords by users. We keep moving over to the right. The name icon there gives you some account management tools. Then we have our activity feed. This is where we'll see different notifications about recent activity in your account. The I or information icon is your help hub. Earlier, we referred to our knowledge base. So for example, you'll find links out to the knowledge base there, quick start guides. For our classroom edition users, this is an icon that we will cover in our separate recorded webinar. This is the course manager. So this is not specific to our professional edition. So this is something we'll hold off and cover in our classroom session. And then last but not least is our skewer menu. And we're going to cover quite a few of the features here later on in our session, such as our widget manager, different utilities and download tools. So now we're back at our demo page. And the first thing we want to do is really demonstrate for you several examples of adding data to Lab Archives. Because of course, when you first create your account, it's empty, there's nothing in it. You add data via entries. And we have a number of different entry types that we support in Lab Archives. And for our session today, we're gonna to cover several of the key entry types. So how you add an entry to a page, two ways. You can either click, Create something new here, which opens up our entry menu, or you can just go back to the entry menu and select your own entry type there. You'll also notice a few of the additional entry types are available at the top, such as rich text, attachment, and office document. So the first entry type I want to demonstrate today is our rich text entry type. This opens up a, a box here for us, like a word processing tool uh, entry here, where you can just add by hand copy, or excuse me, by typing in your specific entry, or perhaps you have some text from another document that you want to add. So I'm gonna type in some text here, and then I'm gonna use some of our tools here to first, for example, enlarge it. I'm going to go ahead and let's say add some color and change that color. And let's say I also want to make it bold or perhaps I want to underline it. I can also center it. So you've got some customization here that's available for you. If you want to insert hyperlinks, for example, and link out to outside resources, we also have our insert hyperlink tool. So for now, let's go ahead and click save to page. And this is our first entry example, and that's a rich text entry. Every entry, 
every edit that you make in lab archives, we keep track of and we have this name, date, and timestamp that's available on every entry. So this is important for research integrity purposes. We are tracking every update, every edit, and that timestamp will update as well. So at 4.02 p.m. Eastern on December 23rd, you can see that Linda Cabayas made this entry. So of course, imagine that likely your notebook may be shared with other lab members. So you'll also clearly see who made that entry and when. Also, all the edits will be kept track of for you. So that's our first entry type. Let's move to another entry type and we'll give you two examples of adding attachments. So a little shortcut there for attachments, or again, if you don't see it, you can go to your new button. We'll go ahead and add an attachment here. So we can browse for attachments from our computer. So let's choose um, an Excel document here. When loading attachments, you may want to consider describing the attachment. So the more metadata that you can add to your information to Lab Archives, the better it is because that makes it more discoverable, right? We want to be able to easily locate the information when we need it. And Lab Archives gives you a number of tools and ways to do that. So when describing the attachment, we want to be more specific. What's in here? If a lab member comes across it, what am I going to find here? Okay, so whatever that description may be, you can add the key information there. You might even consider standardizing the naming of your files as well. So these are all things to think about at the local lab level. So you're going to save to page, and that gives us an attachment. And you can see the name of the attachment as well as my metadata and the description that I've added there, and the name, date, and timestamp. I don't think I mentioned this before, but it's important to note that the timestamp is the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology timestamp. So that is how we keep track of on our back end via our servers, every added entry, every edit that's made. As far as a timestamp here that's reflected, this is going to default to your browser time settings. Let's go ahead and add another attachment, and this time via drag and drop. So what I can do, for example, and let me move this over here, I'm going to select a attachment for my computer. I'm just browsing for it and I'm going to go ahead and choose an image file. And I will go ahead and just drag and drop that on top of the lab archives page. You see the file there uh, is available and I can go ahead and start the upload of that file. So that was via drag and drop. So again, you see your date, name, timestamp. Additionally, what you may want to do is to add headings to the pages as well. So that's another type of entry. Headings give you a way to kind of visually separate the content on the page. So we're going to go to our new entry menu here, select headings. So from our heading, so let's say this is our raw data file and click save to page. Now, this heading actually, I want to refer to this particular Excel file. So with any of your entries, you'll notice if you hover over the entry, get this entry toolbar. So it's specific to the entry here. I can use the arrows to relocate that particular entry on the page. So I've moved my heading from the top to the second point so that now I'm referring to this Excel file here. So you can always, again, reorganize and customize the view and look at the information on the page. Now let's talk about this Excel file that we uploaded here just a moment ago. When you are looking at an Office document, including Excel, Word, or PowerPoint, that gives us this little toolbar here that allows us to view the document, to download the document, or also edit the document. This is part of our Microsoft Office integration with Microsoft Office Online that's available via Lab Archives. So for example, one of the benefits here is that after I upload an Excel document, I can click this edit icon and I can edit that document live within Lab Archives. So for example, 
if I have come across a section of data here, let's say that I um, want to highlight for my colleagues and I'm kind of just noting like, you know what, this is a really important section. I want us all to focus on these, these particular lines of data. So then I highlight it. Okay, so I'm gonna fill it with some color and I'm gonna go ahead and close the document. Now, Lab Archives is still open. Lab Archives has just automatically saved that information. You see that right there? My timestamp has just been updated. If I go back to view the document, there are my changes. So all of the other lab members, all of my other colleagues, when they come into up, uh, to view this document, they're going to be able to see my updates. That is a big benefit there to be able to view the document within Lab Archives and also make uh, edits very quickly. So again, that's part of your Microsoft Online integration within Lab Archives. It also allows you to work within the document at the same time as well. So for simultaneous viewing and editing of the documents. Because it is Microsoft Online, you'll just need to remember that there are going to be some features of like some advanced features, especially within Excel that may not be available because Microsoft Online is essentially a, a um, kind of a, a limited or pared down version of the desktop version. So if that concerns you, you may consider using our desktop version, excuse me, the desktop version of Excel through one of our download tools called Microsoft Office plugin. I'm gonna show you how to use that plugin here in just a moment. So continuing on with different entry types here, let's go ahead and talk about those download tools. One of them I just referred to. So if you go to the skewer menu, upper right-hand corner of the screen, and you go to downloads, you'll see our two download tools. One is folder monitor. The second one is Microsoft Office plugin. Being that they are downloads means it requires that you download them on each device that you want to use lab archives with. So your own personal computer, and maybe the computers that you have available within the lab, for example. So each need to separately use and have these uh, features downloaded. So I have some examples of these tools already at work here. So I'm just going into some screenshots that I have. And we'll start with our first download tool, which is called Folder Monitor. Folder Monitor is a great tool that allows you to, to sync data that may be constantly changing or updating on your computer. So for example, it's, if you have a particular piece of software you work, maybe it's an imaging piece of software, and it's constantly uploading data onto your computer, okay? Let's, let's say it's images, for example, from a microscope. Rather than you know, doing manual attachment uploads like we just did, you know, you're dragging and dropping those files in, you can use Folder Monitor to essentially create a rule letting Folder Monitor know what folder on your computer do you want us to view and have that information be synced and added into Lab Archives whenever either new data is added or an edit is made to a document. That information then on the back end is automatically synced and uploaded into your Lab Archives account for you. So this is an example here of you selecting essentially what are we viewing, what, mon uh, what folder on your computer, and all that information is brought in and you dictate where within Lab Archives that information goes. So again, it's a great way to get a lot of data into your notebook while allowing you to continue to work directly in your computer or, on those or within those files and then seamlessly import that data to Lab Archives. The other download tool is one that I already referred to, and that's Microsoft Office plugin. So I showed you how the Microsoft Online integration works within Lab Archives. It's a nice, nice really convenience factor there to be able to open up the document quickly, view it, and make some quick edits. One of the drawbacks, though, is that that document that you've edited, you haven't edited your desktop version because you're working within Microsoft Office Online. And in some research um, cases, you may need that document downloaded or saved back to your desktop. And if that's something you need, the Microsoft Office plugin might be your best bet for working with Office documents. 
So this allows you to open up the desktop version of an Office document, like PowerPoint, Excel, or Word, and save that information back into Lab Archives and have it saved on your desktop. One of the benefits and advantages is that your revisions are kept track of through the revision history in Lab Archives. So when you open up one of your Office documents, this is the file feature, okay, the file option, and you'll just see added to your Lab Archive document these three additional features, login, save as, open from Lab Archives. And again, it's one way to do a single save, but then having it saved to your computer and to Lab Archives. When you are using Folder Monitor or Microsoft Office plugin for the first time on your computer, you will need to use a password token. This is because you are a single sign-on user via, via Carnegie Mellon University. So for that first time you use these tools, we just need to correctly associate your accounts. So you would, for example, be prompted from your username at the top here to select Lab Archives App Authentication for a one-time password token you'll be asked to enter. Okay, so that's only when you use those download tools for the first time. You'd enter your email address. You're gonna copy the password that was been created for you. And then you'll get access to those two download tools. Another entry type example I wanna give you are widgets. So this is an example of several widgets here, but actually prior to giving you this example, let me go back to my demo page and show you how you insert a widget first. That's an important point here to make. So from the demo page, widgets are just like any other entry type. You select them from the entry menu, select widget, and then you need to choose what type of widget you want to insert into Lab Archives. So first of all, what's a widget? So they're customizable interactive HTML forms or applications. They can also be tailored for your specific experiment, um, contain interactive text boxes, buttons, for example. And here from our pull down menu, you get access to our widget library. We have currently about 30 to 35 widgets that are available. So from here, you're able to take any widget you have access to and go ahead and just insert it. So we have widgets in the form of calculators, for example. And you can just save that widget as an entry. So I have a few other widgets here that have already been saved to show you how those work. So for example, we have a freezer box widget that has been created here. You can hover over the cells for additional information. You can always edit the contents of the widget as well. We have an example of a database widget here. So you can import a CSV file. We'll create a database for you available within Lab Archives. And then the bottom here is an example of a custom widget that one of our customers created and shared with us. So this is a widget in the um, form of a, a data entry form. So specific information that needs to be logged within the lab here. So we can enter in all this information and then you've got a customized form but also one that's consistent that all of your lab members can use to gather and enter data. Our custom widgets are available via the skewer menu, and we have a widgets manager feature that's available for creating custom widgets. Custom widgets are done by the owners of the notebooks there. So we do offer one-on-one -on -one consults for anybody that wants to create a widget or needs some additional help. Our tech support team is happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one to create your custom widget and form. So let's talk a little bit more about managing data. So to do that, let's go back to our demo page. And then we'll work up this particular page and let's look at our first entry point here. We talked about some of the points already for managing data. Edit icon to edit. Remember, we use the arrow icons to adjust the placement of an entry on the page. But also important and up next is our tag feature. Tagging is a way for you to apply metadata at the entry level. 
we recommend that you create your own tags, um, a kind of a control tag or vocabulary that you can use across your lab here. So you'll see that I have a number of tags already in use within my notebook, but I can also create new tags if I'd like. So if I wanted to use the tag cancers here, I can click close, but you can also apply multiple tags to a record. Once you have tags available within your notebook, you can also click on the tags in the upper right hand corner of your notebook and we'll search for any other entries that may give you matches to that particular tag. So for example, if we go back to our introduction and I click on my CRISPR tag, this will give you a better example. You'll see if I have multiple documents tagged with CRISPR, I can then sort them by most recent first or newest to oldest. And this is a great project management tool. So for example, imagine that I'm a PI, I can sort by that and I can see, okay, some of the newest CRISPR information that's been added to my notebook. And I can see what my colleagues have been up to. Additionally, if we go back to my demo page here and we hover over the notebook, up next we have our linking feature. Within your notebook and within your entries, you can link out to supplemental information. Now that information be from an outside resource. Maybe there is something stored outside of lab archives that you want to refer to. Or maybe you want to point to information that's already within your notebook. So you can create a link to that information. So as our, as our example, let's link to a page or entry in the notebook. And let's imagine that we're linking to a protocol. Okay, so if I have some results here from let's say an experiment, and it's important to know what protocol did I use? And that protocol might be in a different section of my notebook. I can browse for that information, make the selection to the entry or to the page, click link to, my link is added there, but before we officially post the link, it's important to consider the version of the page you want to use the most current revision or the version when this link was created. So think about protocols. Now there is a chance they change over time. You've adjusted the protocol. So if that's going to be changing and editing, it might be important to select version when this link was created because then I can refer to that appropriate protocol that I followed, not the one that's available three weeks from now, but the one I use today. Okay, and that information will be kept track of and will link to the correct version for you. So we can add that link. We can click close. And then if you look to the right hand of the record, you have that link icon indicating some supplemental information should be looked at or viewed. And that links us out to the information to the protocol where we could follow by clicking go to entry. Additionally, what's available is this cloud, excuse me, the, our comments feature. You have this little cloud here. Comments are a way to kind of just casually and formally communicate information across or within the team here. What you can do is to post comments to the entire team or you can direct them to individuals. So if you wanted to direct it to an individual lab member, you would use the at feature. And that would bring up the list of people that have access to your notebook. And then you can choose to direct your comment to that particular individual. When you click add comment, the comment is posted. Additionally, what we'll see is that comment cloud now has a number next to it indicating one comment has been made. That person that we directed our comment to also received an email notifying them that a comment has been made. And they can actually address or um, speak to that comment, or I should say reply to that comment via their email. Comments are the one type of information that can be deleted in lab archives. So if the comments start to get a little messy, unruly, irrelevant, whatever it may be, you can always clear them from the account by clicking that trash can symbol. Comments are also kept track of in the activity feed, which we'll touch on here in just a moment. So one final thing that we wanna cover here when we're talking about managing data. 
Let's talk about the image annotator, but then that also gives us a nice lead into our revisions history, which is a really important benefit and part of using lab archives. So to annotate an image, let's look at, at let's look at, excuse me, and use this one image that we have on the screen here. So you've got a different little kind of tool tray that's available. We want to annotate the image. That gives us a way to you know, somewhat customize this here with our drawing tools that are available. So let's say I want to call out non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So I'm going to circle this. And I just want to kind of call that out to my lab members as being the important part here that we want to focus on. Okay. So I've gone ahead and added that. We want to save it. Okay, so then we're going to close this. I made the annotation. We're back into lab archives. You see immediately that's been adjusted and it's available within the view from the notebook. Now let's say though that I've made a mistake. I circled the wrong line. Okay, so that leads us into the power of the revision history in lab archives. So that takes us to this tool icon here, this, or excuse me, this gear icon, where we're going to look at the revisions at the entry level. So I can see my revision I just made at 422 Eastern, added, deleted annotation. Then I can preview the original and I can say, yes, that's what I want. I want to get back to the original version. So then I can click revert to this version and we're back to my clean version. Okay, so crisis averted. Okay, so now if I need to correctly make the annotation, I can do that. But let's say I notice that, you know what, I've uploaded the wrong image. I've got a more maybe up to date version of the document. So I'm going to go to that gear icon and I'm going to delete it. That has deleted the entire entry. But remember, Nothing, no data in lab archives is ever permanently deleted. That's great news. Why? Because let's say I just made a big mistake. I deleted the file and I should not have. And it's important. I need to get that back into my notebook. So we do offer tools available to bring that information back. The way that we can do that, it's not from this crap trash can here. I think it's important to note that this trash can contains deleted pages or folders and not deleted entries. My deleted entry, if I want to bring it back, I can go to my little page tools icon there. I want to review, I want to, excuse me, view revisions at the page level. Most recent revisions are at the top. I can see my deleted item at the top and I want to undelete it. right back up on the page now, okay? So again, if I need to maybe correct the order, I can use those arrows that are available there. So again, you've got that full revision history that's available to keep track of every change that's been made to the page. And it's a great way to bring back anything that may have inadvertently been deleted. Let's go up to our activity feed. So this is a really nice project management tool. So if you want to see, let's say from the PI perspective, you're the owner of the notebook. What's been done in the notebook? By who, when? That's when you can use the activity feed. So I have a quick little summary here of recent activity. 13 comments, new course content, et cetera. Some of this will not be um, relevant to the professional edition. Some of this has to do with the classroom edition. I want to open up that activity feed. And you are able to view the activity feed information across all of your notebooks or in a specific notebook. So let's say I want to focus in on my professional edition notebook because that's the one that we were just working on here. There it is, Lab Archives Professional. I'm going to apply that. Now I'm able to view that information at the notebook level. And again, I can choose multiple notebooks. So all my recent activity, I can view that. So if I'm the PI, I can say, oh, okay, you know what? Linda's doing a lot of work. Wow, why is Linda doing all of the work? Why aren't any of my other lab uh, members participating? So that's the type of information you know, I'd be able to find within the activity feed. Okay, that opens up in a separate tab. So we'll go ahead and close that. And that takes us right back into our demo page. Next, let's talk about a really important part of lab archives. That's access management. 
Remember from our intro slides, we talked about the owner creates the notebook. And then after that, it's the owner or the administrator that grants membership access to the notebook. So let's cover how that works. So we're gonna to go to our skewer icon. We're going to select notebook settings. From notebook settings, we want the second tab, which is user management. Uh, within the notebook settings, you have some, some um, default settings that you can adjust here, referring to comments, entries, and page signing, for example. But what we want, user management. This page will also show you who has access to your notebook. So you'll see the access information if you're the owner or the administrator. When you're ready to invite somebody to your notebook, you just click on that new user and you enter in the email address of the person you'd like to invite. You click add new user. By default, when that new user is added to your notebook, you will see an email is sent to them to notify them. But also, when you look at the list here, invite me at labarchives.com. By default, their role is a user. If I need to upgrade them to administrator, I can do that. Maybe I need to change them to guest access. I can do that at any time. If you utilize page signing or witnessing, you can also add them as a member that has access to those tools. But also, let's say that that member leaves a lab a year or two from now, whatever it may be. I can remove their access. It's important to note that when you remove access, you are not removing any of their work. They've added folders, entries, edits. All of that stays there. It's simply their access that you're taking away. Additionally, if you are the owner, you can transfer ownership. If you're a PI moving on to a new university, leaving the particular project, you can transfer your notebook. We um, want you to consider, of course, to transfer to someone else um, that may be perhaps a, the new PI, maybe a lab supervisor, for example. And that's, again, access management, where you can come in here at any time to invite or remove access to the notebook. So in addition to sharing an entire notebook, you, you can also give access to a part of a notebook down to a single entry. So where we can do that, for example, if you go back to the structure of the notebook, let's say you go to your demo page. You can do this from a folder, a page, or an entry. I'm gonna show you how you do this from a page. You're gonna right click a page, and then you will see that you have a share option that's available. Click on that share feature, you can invite the person to that particular page. So similar to what we did before. Add in the email address. You can send a copy of that email to yourself. Now you can dictate, are they going to have view or edit access? This is inviting them as a guest to the notebook this, in this level. So they're going to be a guest with you or edit access. I can click to close. Now they will have access to that particular page only. If I want to change that later. I can also go back to the page. I can go back to the share feature. I can see who has access and make adjustments to their level of access there as well. It also reminds me who has access. Additionally, I can do that same thing from the permissions as well. So very quickly, let's touch on a few little extra features that are available within Lab Archives before we wrap up. First of all, that would be signing and witnessing. If your lab has a requirement for signing and witnessing, sometimes that is because perhaps you have um, FDA CFR Part 11 compliancy that you have to work with based on funding agency requirements. So signing essentially locks the page so that no more edits can occur within the page. Okay? So again, when you sign a page, you essentially are locking the page in place. We also have an example where after a page has been signed 
and that would be done via the page tools if it's available. You could also witness a page. So it's kind of like two levels. After a page is signed, additionally, you can have a witnesser approve or disapprove of the signed page. Last but not least, let's touch on exporting your notebook. So exporting your notebook is a way to download your notebook. You can either export your entire notebook or just portions of your notebook. Let's so go back to our skewer icon here. And under our utilities feature, we have our two export options, which include creating an offline notebook or sending your notebook to PDF. So I have some examples here of those options available right now. Your offline notebook creates a zipped file version of your notebook that's available offline. So your notebook is available, you can browse, you have the um, current structure of the notebook available. And also the attachments are exported and available to you as well. So it's an HTML version of your notebook. Then you have your PDF version of your notebook. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward here. We export your notebook available as a PDF. You do have a live table of contents that's available where you can navigate to the specific parts of your um, notebook. Additionally, what's important to consider here, if I go to a different page, the attachments though, way the attachments fu um, function, is you have a link to download them. That takes you to the original notebook where the attachment resides. You may, when it's time to download, consider both versions. Some people like that um, offline notebook because the attachments are pulled out and available locally on your computer. Other people kind of prefer the ease of navigation of the PDF version. But then consider also that within the notebook itself, you can download specific sections. So you could click to right click there and use the download feature, such as right here listed via the PDF tool to download as a PDF that particular page. So that takes us to the end of our live demo of Lab Archives. So in the time that we had together today, we demonstrated how you can organize your notebook using a folder, page, and entry structure. We talked about how you can add data using rich text entry, attachments, uh, Microsoft Office plugin, folder monitor. And then we also cover different data management tools, such as tags and access management. And then we also have time to discuss exporting your data as well. So I hope that after this session, you feel empowered and ready to start using Lab Archives to manage your research. Don't forget about support that's available through our technical support team, as well as, I'll pop this up right now, your local lab archives page available through Carnegie Mellon. So that URL, just one more time, is library.cmu.edu forward slash lab archives. From there, you have additional help and you have your link to your local life, uh, data services library team that can provide you with customized consultation assistance in using lab archives. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, don't forget, email us if you need us at support at labarchives.com.